In 10th century, Central Europe consisted of dozens self-governed and divided against themselves tribal authorities. Despite speaking one language, having same pagan beliefs and similar economic development. One of the biggest and most influential tribes was the tribe of Poland, governed by the Piast dynasty with a firm hand of a young prince, Mieszko I. Mieszko's father knew that expansion was the only way to halt the never-ending quarrel and broaden the influence of the Piast family, so, on his deathbed, he made Mieszko promise that he would be the one to unite the tribes under one nation, whatever the cost. Consequently, Mieszko carried out his quest with the dignity of cunning ruler, making treaties and winning allies amongst other tribes, expanding the jurisdiction of Poland. Yet, ambition is much like addiction, and Mieszko's unyielding expanse was bound to rattle a cage or two. Soon, Mieszko I started a ruinous clash with Orton tribes. The other lands were fertile and abundant, so Mieszko wasn't the only leader aspiring to dominate it, and Poland entered the sphere of German influence, who started to support the northern tribes. As a result of this clash, Mieszko was forced to pay a tribute to the German emperor. The prince knew the homage was the only way to secure the unity of newly formed Poland's nation and a real way to avert the otherwise indubitable invasion of German forces. Mieszko knew the tribute was crippling the Poland's economy and was just a quick fix for the big problem of a young nation stuck between powerful nations. The pagan Poland's were considered heathens, what gave the progressive West a political mandate for edification. Mieszko figured that the formidable ally will give his people protectorate and promptly started a diplomatic relationship with Bohemian ruler Boleslav I. As a result of these negotiations, Mieszko was to renounce his pagan ways and marry Boleslav's daughter Dobrava in exchange for latitude in dealings with the northern tribes. In order to secure the deal, Princess Dobrava was sent to meet her future husband and alongside her entourage, I, a humble monk, as a part of Christianizing mission of the Poland state. However, as the negotiations only just began, the boiling north realized that there will be no better time to attack. Under the banner of an outlaw German Count Wichmann, who wanted a share of the other lands as well, the tribes rushed Jeszko's lands. Mieszko was fully aware of the gravity of his decisions. The Poland state was still under fire of German forces that used Christianization as an excuse for its forays. Dobrava's mission was to convince Mieszko of Christian ways. To make it short, and only due to my responsibilities as a chronicler, I must mention that her charm was enough for the prince to rebuff his seven pagan wives. The decision seemed simple enough. On a cold morning of 966, Mieszko I was baptized. As a Christian, Mieszko could finally secure the territory of an acknowledged Polish nation. Mieszko was about to place a final blow to the rebellious northern tribes and become the first ruler of the Polish nation. Wichmann's death was not only satisfactory for Mieszko due to personal reasons, most importantly, the success in the north strengthened the newly brewed alliance between Poland and Bohemia, proving Mieszko's choices right. What is more, through the adaptation of Christianity, Poland were no longer in danger of invasions for the purpose of Christianization. The baptism sparked the development of education and culture through clergy, as well as an improvement in the state of administration and diplomacy. Appropriately, Poland started paying a tribute to the Pope, as now it has become a part of a greater European family. Mieszko's family also grew, as Dobrawa gave him a strong heir, Bolesław, named after her father. Despite Mieszko's efforts, however, the troubles did not end. 
Mieszko's brother himself, reported of a problem in the West. One of the conquered tribes asked the German nobleman Margrave Hoden for help in exchange for their serfdom. This arbitrary action without emperor's consent sparked not only a rebellion, but a full-blown invasion of German forces on Poland. While Czcibor was busy slowing down Hodon's armies, Mieszko seeked refuge in outpost of Cedynia. Surprisingly enough, Mieszko did not seem troubled by the outcome of the mission. Quite the contrary, Mieszko's plan was to stage retreat and bait Hodon's forces to attack on the outpost, where he could hold his ground against much more assailants than in the open field. As his troops prepared for the defense, Mieszko's brother, Czcibor, got his best warriors ready to flank Hodon's forces. Czcibor's mission was to target the best knights in Hodon's army in order to disrupt its ranks and wreak havoc amongst the infantry. The war with Hoden ended with Poland's territory finally secured. However, Mieszko and Hoden no longer conduct solely on their own behalf. As a part of a Christian union, they've been called to the Imperial Diet in Quedlinburg, where they were to face the judgment of the Emperor Otto I. Otto I mediated the truce between Hoden and Mieszko. Mieszko held a dependency of the Western territories, but the prince was also obliged to send Boleslav as a hostage to the imperial court, despite Hoden being an instigator in this quarrel. Little they knew, experience gathered by young Boleslav will help him become the first king of Poland that will not only cement Poland's position in Europe, but expand its influence even further. Nevertheless, due to Mieszko's policy, conquest and diplomacy, Slavic tribes in Central Europe were united. The prince is considered a founder of Poland and the Piast dynasty ruled over and expanded the country's territory, becoming one of the most powerful nations in Europe. When my grandfather Mieszko died in 992 AD, Poland was divided among his sons. My father, Boleslav I, said it was ironic as my grandfather's wish was to unite the tribes under one banner and felt his testament may be lost to a brotherly quarrel instead. As my father was Mieszko's firstborn, he felt it was his rightful destiny to rule Poland. To achieve this, he fought and defeated his own stepbrothers and exiled them, assuring Poland's unity and his rule. As a young child, Boleslav was held as a peacetime hostage by a German court, where he learned the ropes in leadership and knighthood. Among the many patrons he met in his time there was Otto III, the young Holy Roman Emperor. My father personally invited Otto to come to Poland only once his power had been consolidated. During one of the many sumptuous feasts, Otto shared his lifelong dream, a Roman Empire restored as a federation, with Boleslav crowned the ruler of Poland. However, the young emperor's dream never came true. His premature death threw Europe into turmoil. Taking advantage of the situation, my father hastily took control of the German lands on the Polish border. Hoping to use the newly acquired lands to begin the long march to a Polish kingdom, Boleslav was instead summoned to Merseburg, the home of the Holy Roman Emperor. There he met the newly crowned Henrik II, whom he hoped would give him his crown, promised by Otto. Instead, my father's ambitions were stripped away, and his newly conquered borderlands became a part of nothing but a fiefdom. But, as happens within Greeks, that meeting was just smoke and mirrors. As Boleslav was returning to Poland, he was ambushed by bandits. He suspected his attackers were sent by Henrik. That was too much for him. Not being known for his patience or an even temper, he promised if Henrik wanted war, he'd give him war. Sixteen years have passed since that promise. Henrik II has today gathered the largest invasion force Poland has ever seen and is making his way to the Gord of Niemcza. 
it was I, Mieszko, second of his name, and Boleslav's son, who has been tasked to hold the line, by whatever means necessary. The German blockade lasted for a month. They tried to break our line with siege weapons and by burning the nearby settlements to ash. Still, I never opened the gates as I awaited my father's arrival. When his banner finally loomed over the horizon, I smiled, knowing his succor would be bloody and that Henrik would remember that. While we held out against the Germans, my father had been busy assuring Henrik's doom he had set up his camp on the Bohemian border, blocking additional support to Henrik's army while using guerrilla tactics to bleed the Emperor dry, one battalion at a time. Eventually, Henrik's anger capitulated. My father and I felt we had reached the limit of our war and should sheathe our swords, simply not to go mad. Well, that was the polite way to tell the Emperor. He'd lost. A peace treaty was signed in Bujizin in 1018. As a guarantee of our pact, Boleslav married Oda, a German royal, and Emperor Henrik handed over the disputed territory. But as one trouble ended, another began. One of my sisters had been kidnapped by the self-appointed ruler of Kiev, the Crown Prince Yaroslav. The city of Kiev was known throughout Europe for its riches, so it wasn't hard for my father to convince Henrik, our now ally, to aid him in his quest. The Emperor's troops soon joined our forces as we made our way towards the Bug River, where Yaroslav's first line of defense awaited our arrival. At that time, my father was known for losing his temper. I guess this rumor reached Yaroslav too late. He never suspected such mockery would drive my father to personally cross the river and cut out the tongues of his hecklers. Soon, the river turned red, and Yaroslav tucked his tail and ran like a coward back to Kiev. We pursued him, leaving no gourd or settlement in our wake. Not until Yaroslav put forward his most fearsome mercenaries, the Varangans, were we driven to a halt. My father knew that even with all the forces we had, we could only defeat Yaroslav's mercenaries through surprise and stealth. I was sent to the most narrow neck of the Dnieper River to stop the arriving Varangans and their Drakkar ships from reaching Kiev. The Drakkar ships were ablaze and the remaining survivors jumped into the river, only to sink like rocks under the weight of their armor. Those who managed to reach the shore were welcomed with a volley of arrows. After the battle, some of my troops swept the battlefield to bring mercy to those whose spirits were left unbroken. As soon as the Varangans were dealt with, I sent a messenger to my father. The road to Kiev was secured, and Yaroslav city was ready for the taking. I soon followed knowing my father would not waste a moment more to storm the gates of Kiev. As Boleslav was entering Kiev, he notched his sword over the city's golden gate as any good conqueror would. Kiev was plundered and Yaroslav's family taken as hostages, including one of Yaroslav's sisters, who quickly became my father's new bride. Poland's territory grew, but we still weren't officially a kingdom. As long as I can remember, my father always wanted a crown. He said we were destined for it. He raised me to become a king, to become a part of the royal family. But despite everything, our newest ally, Henrik II, remained in fact a silent foe, successfully blocking our efforts for kingship. In 1024, however, we saw a glimmer of hope. First, Henrik died, causing a struggle for the crown among its rightful claimants. Soon afterwards, the Pope, who also opposed a Polish coronation, went to meet his maker. My father took advantage of this interregnum and crowned himself a king 
in the Royal Gniezno Cathedral in 1025. Finally, Poland was a kingdom, rightfully recognized by both the Holy Roman Empire and the Papacy. Unfortunately, destiny deemed my father's kingship to be in title only. Two months after the coronation, his spirit left his body. Yet what he built was much stronger. Finally, Poland manifested its long-awaited independence as a sovereign state. However, his legacy is not easy to bear, as his impatience and stubbornness created numerous enemies from both afar and within our newborn kingdom. And as the new king of Poland, I, Mieszko, second of his name, need to deal with all of them.